Hello, everyone. Welcome or welcome back to the Dan Nessel Show. I'm your host, Dan Nessel. You know, we've talked a lot about influence on this show, about, uh, you know, influencer marketing and things like that. Well, today, I'm so pleased and lucky to have with us a true influencer, somebody who has done more to influence the PR and communications profession than most people I've ever met. Um, She is an industry influencer in the most fundamental way, her experience, her books, her speaking engagements, her classes, her videos, and her podcasts have all helped to shape modern communications as we know it. And now as an entrepreneur, a consultant, tireless advocate for women in business, you know, for ethics, for humanity and communications, she's the author of numerous books, including Social Media and Public Relations, PR 2.0, Putting the Public Back in Public Relations, and the soon to be available Answers for Ethical Marketers. She's the founder of the Women Worldwide Network. It gives me great pleasure to welcome to the show Deirdre Breckenridge. I can't believe I'm, I'm here with Deirdre Breckenridge, like an idol of mine for mm, years, <laughs> so many years. And just to see you, and, and I'm sorry, my listeners, our listeners can't see this because we're, we don't do video on the Dan Nessel show yet. But I mean, just to see uh, Deirdre on screen with me is like some kind of big loop has not closed, but has come very close close to going full circle because in my early uh, learnings as I was, you know, kind of becoming a digital PR and marketing professional, I read this great book called Putting the Public Back in Public Relations. And one of the authors is this lady named Deirdre Breckenridge. And I know she was from New Jersey, but put it aside. It was in the bookshelf, right? And then, of course, I'm tracking over LinkedIn many years. Oh yeah, sure. Yeah. Deirdre, that Boy, I've been following you as a thought leader. And then um, a couple of months ago, I suddenly connected with you on LinkedIn directly <laughs> and then the world changed. So as a result of that, here we are. And I'm just pleased as punch to have Deirdre Breckenridge right here with me. How are I'm, you, Deirdre? I'm great. I'm so happy to be here with you. I, I appreciate you being here. And uh, I know you've been really busy these days. And um, as my listeners know, this show can be all about, um, it tends to be about things related to marketing, things related to PR, um, things related to personal development, self-improvement. And I think that you cover all those bases. <laughs> I think you're one of those guests that are covering all the bases. So I wanted to start out just by asking you to share a little bit, for those who aren't familiar with Deirdre Breckenridge, like to share a little bit about your journey, like where you're at now and um, like what's going on in your life. Well, thank you so much for asking. Thank you for having me on your show. So my journey, oh my goodness, uh, it's been an incredible journey. I actually was one of those kids who got very lucky, who knew what she wanted to do (laughs) in high school. Can you imagine, Dan? I can't imagine that at all. It it was crazy because, you know, you, you would never expect that a guidance counselor says to you, oh, you should either be in journalism or PR. And I said, oh, what is this PR thing? Mm -hmm. (laughs) Let let me try it. But I love to write. That was it. You know, always a writer, whether it was in fourth grade making little storybooks or winning essay contests. I just always love to share and to be a storyteller. And PR, what a great way to get there. I stayed um, agency side. Passion was always agency, but smaller Mm -hmm agency. And what was interesting, I guess, after working 10 years for an agency, all of a sudden I got bit by an entrepreneurial bug. (laughs) And even though everybody around me thought that I would go on and work in some company and be doing public relations there or wherever the storytelling was going to take me, uh, I decided that I was going to go out on my own and launch my own company And I did that. I had an agency for a while. I loved it. I started to, I got very lucky with its skill, luck and timing with the books, wrote Mm -hmm. a whole bunch of books and then realized, oh my goodness, I'm out on the road. I'm speaking. I'm talking to the media. Maybe it's time to be a consultant, continue Mm -hmm. with the writing, do some teaching. And that sort of has me to where I am today, which I help other people with their storytelling and igniting Mm -hmm. these passionate stories and leading pressing conversations. 
and really creating impact and building relationships. And I love it. So extremely passionate. Yeah. And it's clear in your work. I mean, if anybody, uh, we'll get to all of the places where you can find Deirdre later, but one place in particular where uh, there's been a lot of activity is the Women Worldwide Network. And the work that you're doing there, especially, of course, in support of primarily women, although there have been a couple of men on that site. And one of these days, Deirdre, I will hopefully wrangle myself an invitation, but- um, Come on, but you, on Dan. Okay. <laughs> I, got some, I have to have something. Good to say, we, only, we have a, a, a male executive business professional probably like every other month or once yeah. a quarter, but you will be there, my friend. I appreciate that. But there's no need really because the array of professionals that you have mm-hmm. on that site and on your show, um, you've had a couple of hundred episodes already of your podcast. You're not going to believe it, but it's actually, we're so close to 300. You see, it just goes, I'm, I'm on 30. So you've had oh, 10 great. times as many. Well, that's I mean, awesome. It's, I feel good about it. You know, I'm here with you. It's things, something's going well. But I am just, I look at folks like like you, certainly who have been plugging away at this space and just building a following, doing it right for a couple of years and a couple, three, four, five, six, seven, <laughs> how many, however many years. But the point is that you're, you're kind of single-mindedly in support of women on this and this is part of your mission on this particular site. I know that you have other concerns that you're doing at the same time, and hopefully we'll get to those, but what's going on with the Women Worldwide Network and how'd you get that going? And what is your, what's your kind of, you know, I'm not gonna say end game because that's an ongoing concern. What's happening there? So thank you for asking because Women Worldwide started just as this experiment. I mean, I have always been telling the folks around me that you need to reinvent yourself through media, embrace, try new things. So I noticed the resurgence of podcasting, I guess it was in 2013, and I started to do some research. I teamed up with the social network station. They let me host a show or two. And it was also at the time, Dan, that women were being harassed and cyber bullied online. And I mean, this is, this is really sad. Um, I had met Carol Todd, who was the mother of Amanda Todd. And Amanda had taken her life at age 16. And I remember watching a YouTube video where it was about nine minutes. Amanda was showing cards that had words and, and sharing her story through words. And I, either I saw this or I interpreted it, but it, what she was sharing was that she didn't have a voice. And she didn't feel like she had anybody to turn to. And when I realized this, I said, oh my gosh, a young woman, any woman, you know, we all need a voice. We need a platform. Women Worldwide became that platform. And really it is all about sharing stories, motivating and inspiring others, and also getting down to what are your challenges? What's going on? And when you can share your challenges and give advice and how you got through it, you're helping so many other people. And that's really what this show has been. So it's been your platform to share your own challenges as well as those of your guests. I mean, I was listening to one of your episodes earlier about um, putting yourself out there, you know, about, um, you know, what's holding you back. That was a yes. recent episode you did, a solo, a rare solo episode. But, mm-hmm. uh, you know, um, I will recommend that just because it says the women's women worldwide network, it is absolutely for men to listen to this. I mean, it is a great, great program. And I listened to this, to this piece and it's been kind of ringing true to me these days a lot. Like why did I start the podcast and why am I trying to help other people do the similar, similar things? And, but it's not just me, this whole COVID era that we're in has, I think, right. you know, put a lot of people into this groove where they're like doing things that they never done before. And one of the th- I guess topics keeps coming up is, well, what was holding you back before? What's holding you back now? And to hear that you say that people are are looking externally for acceptance rather than internally. Yep. That was so huge. <laughs> That's I think such that, a big one. Yeah. And I don't know what, how you feel about this, but you know, one of my theories is that the advent of work from home or remote work in such a massive uh, volume or frequency, whatever, with so many people, has forced that a lot, has forced people to stop being externally focused on what others are thinking and start looking at themselves because that's all they have to look at every day. So loneliness is there, solitude, 
maybe people have lost a sense of belonging. But the flip side of that is, for many, a chance to grasp themselves again and to look Find at themselves. Find yourself. There's yeah. discovery. That's the best thing possible. I think when we're so absorbed with what's going on externally, and it, it's hard not to be absorbed because mm-hmm. we live, you're Listeners can't see it, but I'm holding up my smartphone. I mean, we live by our smartphones. We have smartwatches. Our homes are connected. We can ask Alexa anything. She'll probably turn on right now. Um, The news bombards us. And all of that takes us away from who are we? What are we about? What's their biggest purpose? How can we get there? Let's try something new. Let's create. Like, we shouldn't forget that we're creators. Oh, you're singing my song there, sister. Right? Yeah, absolutely. Yes. Yeah. Um, that's that's what I've been, you know, kind of beating the drum about these days is that we all have an imperative, a creative imperative in many ways. But what creation looks like, what is creativity is a big question sure. that I think people don't know how to answer. And, and maybe there is no solid answer for it. I mean, to me, it means there was nothing. Now there's something, right? So right. in the very, the very simplest way, uh, you know, it's just making something that didn't exist before. But Obviously, we get bogged down in, do I have the standing to do this? Am I just going to embarrass myself by trying to make something? Or am I going to make it right? Or, you know, however many things are blocking us from taking that step to being a creative, to exploring our own creativity. Yeah, that Um, first, um, I think I also mentioned this in my solo episode, mm -hmm. that first feeling, we get excited, right? There's something new. I'm, I'm going to create this. I've never done it before. You get excited. And then the minute you let the external in, all that excitement gets squashed and you don't find your path. That inner GPS, that initial reaction, it's almost like go with it. And I don't know, I'm, I'm all for, oh, so what? I mean, you can't, you're not going to break social media. You're not going to, you're not going to break Squadcast where we're recording. Try it. Try different things that you don't even know that you like. That's the only way to do it. Yeah. Get out of your own way. Right. Get out of your way. Step out of your comfort zone. Yeah. And I love the way you said you you put it is to listen to your internal GPS, you know, because totally that's that first signal that you get, you know, follow that signal. And it is so much easier said than done because that doubtful voice, the limiting beliefs, everything Mm -hmm. comes after that, you know, but in that initial excitement, somebody also wants, I, I don't know how you feel about this, but. I feel like a lot, I, I've certainly had some scarring maybe yeah. in my life where I would want to pursue some passionate thing, you know, whether it's a, a piece of writing or, or, you know, a project for work or whatever. And I'd get all excited about it. Then I'd have a boss come in somewhere along the way who'd say, um, you know, hey, is there this dog? I love dogs on podcasts. I'm so it's a great sorry. thing. That, no, you know what? We we keep going. That's what that's the way this thing's that's the way this we look two hey, dogs. We li- I do too. And um and we live in the that's the world we live in, right? We have this is a reality. I was on, you know, I had a, a show recently, one of my um one of my guests, a guy named Glenn Zimmerman, he was saying that when you have a kid jump in a lap or a dog jump, get in the, get in the, in the frame or there's sounds, just let it go, man, because there's that's something the human story. About it. It's there's completely human about human. it. It's a story. So as long as you, we can keep hearing each other, it's cool. But um, I was just thinking that I was just talking about this, this passionate, you know, have being passionate about something. Scarred. Yeah. Being scarred. Right. And cause you have a boss comes in and says, well, you got to be aware of your passion pitfalls. Mm. Right. And there's solid advice there, but I think, I wonder if it's if the timeliness of that may have been a little off base when it comes to my the next five years of my life where I was afraid to push a button, right? So, I mean, has that ever happened to you, Deidre? Have you ever been uh, in that situation? You know what? It did. Um, well, somebody as loving and as kind as they were trying to give advice, um, but I didn't. I didn't listen, thankfully. Mm-hmm. So when I went to share with a close family member that I had gotten my first book contract. I was so excited. They actually a little bit tried to talk me out of it. (laughs) Like, you don't know how to write a book. You've never done this before. You know, you've got a lot of passion and enthusiasm, but that doesn't mean it's a book. And, you know, so I can relate to 
what you said of it being a passion pitfall or somebody mm -hmm. seeing it as that way, but oh my gosh, I'm so happy that I wrote that first book. I, I mean, mm -hmm. I cried the whole way through because I really didn't know the process <laughs> and it was very hard. I had like every week a, a large chapter due, but in mm -hmm. any case, that happens a lot. And that was when I was in my early 30s, I guess. But in my 20s, if you had said that to me, I would have stopped dead in mm. my tracks. So somewhere between, you know, late 20s and early 30s, I stood up and said, no, I'm, yeah. I'm going to go for it and let's see what happens. It's there, hard, though. Yeah, I, I, I've spoken with a neuroscientist or two who could probably tell exactly why that happened, but I'm not that guy. But I, <laughs> I, I, I do know for sure that that we go through changes in our lives and, and certainly we're able to reprogram ourselves and, and, you know, with work, you know, kind of recast the way that we view those inputs. And something but, happens yeah. in your brain when yeah. somebody says that and you start retreating, you go back to the default. It's almost like you go back right. into... I, it's like a reptilian brain, mm -hmm. a survival mode. You're only going to do what you know, and you sort of stay stuck and your thinking reflects it. And it's such a shame because if you were just to stay in the mode of this is a good thing and you're happy about it and you move forward and you can see a path, you're not mm -hmm. in that stuck, older survival brain. Yeah. And the older we get, the harder it is to get to kind of ext extricate ourselves from those voices that tell us, oh, you know. Don't do this, this is bad. Don't do this. Right. You know, you know, nobody's gonna read your article. Yeah, it's all fair. Nobody's gonna, nobody wants to listen to your voice. Thankfully, we have to, we learn how to also ignore those voices and those those pieces of advice sometimes. But, but sometimes you do wanna, wanna heed them, I suppose. You know, you want, we need to be selective enough. I mean, clearly if somebody, if I say to my wife, you know, uh, honey, I'm just gonna, drop everything tomorrow and join the PGA and just become a professional golfer. <laughs> I hope she says, well, Dan. <laughs> That's not all she'd say, believe me. She, cause maybe first you want to take it up as a hobby first. <laughs> exactly. For, maybe you want to learn, like maybe you want to actually get a golf club in your hands exactly. at some point. Because I, I, I have- Play a few holes. I've never played golf, right? <laughs> I mean, but I so, once. So I think I, I like I used to um, go to the, actually, okay. I used to go to the range yeah. with my father-in-law and this is one of those actually, you know, it's kind of a, an apt metaphor, an apt kind of story for, for what we're talking about because my dad was a great golfer and uh, you know, I mean, I, I, I see my friends or people I know who are like, yeah, let's go golfing because I'm, I'm hitting that, uh, that age, I suppose, but I've never been into it. I've never gone. And my father-in-law is a crazy golfer in Japan, you know, he lives right in the golf center of the country. Oh. And there was a period of time where every time I'd go, you know, when I lived in, in Japan, my wife and I would go to my in-laws sometimes on the weekends or whatever, um, certainly for holidays and spend a couple of days. And um, he'd always be like, let's go to the range. And of course, never that happily. He would never say, hey, let's go to the range. He'd say, let's go to the range. <laughs> so, but in, in Japanese. Anyway, he was very, I guess, somewhat ritualistic about it, but also very, very technical and, and oh, he was serious. Very serious. Yeah. So I'd get out there and, and I'd, oh, got a golf club in my hands. I'm good. This is awesome. Let me see if the genetics work because my dad was a good golfer. And they don't work. <laughs> I mean, the, you know, I, I'd, I'd swing away. And, Did your um, father-in-law help you with your swing? Did he Well, that's the thing, you? right? So he, he would stand there and counsel me a little bit. <clears throat> yeah, you know, just uh, <laughs> arms tighter, arms tighter. But I could see it start to boil up and his, like he was starting to get uncomfortable because I just wasn't that good. Yeah, it wasn't fun for him. <laughs> it wasn't fun for him. It wasn't super fun for me either. No. Nope. You know, and uh, I think that had he spoken English, he might have said to me, listen, son, I think it's time to pack it in. <laughs> you know. Um, don't but make he, it your, don't, don't quit your day job. Don't quit your day job. <laughs> you know? Please don't. But point is like, he, he, it, it made it also kind of, I'm not saying it ruined golf for me because it didn't, but it still is like, I feel this kind of like, ickiness about it because triggers I, it's, old I feelings right i yeah. associate it with this kind of almost quasi militaristic like displeasure <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm making it sound a lot worse than it actually was but but the point is like people like those seminal moments can have a serious effect on you and absolutely especially with the creativity and things like this that we're trying to do as as storytellers you know but you mentioned storytelling and again that's another theme that pops up again and again on my show, a lot of that's because I talk to PR people, 
But how do you think that this concept of storytelling has gotten so huge now? In your world and in our world, it's always been big. But now I see it like every other LinkedIn profile I look at is a, is a storyteller or a visual storyteller or this kind of a storyteller. So why do you think that's happened? What's the evolution there? So, I mean, I think social media has a lot to do with it. Our ability to democratize content. We're all storytellers. We're uh, all citizen journalists. Um, we have a, a new megaphone and, a, and a, it was a shiny new object, a platform to be. But I really think that stories are what bind us. People rally around stories. And as long as I'm so happy that as public relations professionals, we finally learn that it's all about the authenticity and the human. And it's not, you know, you, you can't have your companies and your clients showing up as if they're, you know, just sharing their news releases and they're the trained spokespeople. Because it is, it, it's very human. And I think that the technology and the way that media has changed lends hand to the really great human stories that we're sharing and how you can get so much closer to people even before you meet them. That's what I've always said about social media is the fact that I have met the greatest people. The relationships start on social media, but the goal, mm -hmm. even though it's a, now we're in COVID and I'm not seeing a lot of people in person, but the goal is always to be in person. Nothing replaces the, the hug or the handshake. However, it all starts with meeting and congregating and rallying and feeling like you're a part of something. And sometimes a really good story just brings people together. Yeah. Probably even more so now, precisely because you can't meet in person. I mean, a powerful story is, you know, it gets wired directly into your lizard brain or, or whatever it is. And, you know, uh, previous guests have, 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 we've talked about it as being around the campfire, you know, mm -hmm. getting back to that prehistoric or kind of pre-civilization us where, you know, the story is what binds, the story is what tells you how to be safe the next day after the sun wakes, wakes us all up. And the story is what tells us which water to drink and, and what snakes to be careful of and which rivers are going to kill everybody if you go in that direction. You know, like those right. kinds of really important, you know, like to the core of us. And I think that that part of it has maintained its importance in our psyche all these gen, you know, these thousands of years, and now it's in the hands of PR people. Right. And we have you know? so many places to share. That's yeah. the thing. And being really, um, I don't know, smart, uh, human, uh, strategic, um, the way that we connect and the way that, and, and also the way we feel together. I'm, I'm very big now on making connections that, you're building genuine relationships because we are tapping into feelings and emotional intelligence as a part of the way that, you know, our stories are told, the way that they're perceived, the way that we can connect on a deeper level. Something you said there is actually just kind of standing out to me. You talked about emotional intelligence and this whole idea of connection. And that's kind of blending across the activities that we do and certainly into our storytelling. I was wondering like if you could talk a little bit about that, a little bit about emotional intelligence, you know, cause when we, when we met last time, you talked about that a little bit and said that, that we're all energy, right. And that has something to do with emotional intelligence. Yeah. I feel like we're, yeah. we're all energy and we're all connected. However, mm -hmm. we block energy all the time if we're not being emotionally intelligent. The first part of being emotionally intelligent is being self-aware and actually having a handle on what's going on with yourself. If you are so bombarded and your head is all cluttered and there's no clarity in your thinking, there's no way that you can be emotionally intelligent because if you can't handle what's going on with you, you certainly can't tap into somebody else. And tapping into somebody else on whatever level, you're tapping into energy in a sense. And we're drawn together for reasons. So yeah. I'm also a big believer in the law of attraction and the universe. Right. So it, it's all connected that way. But if you're not emotionally intelligent, then how do you tap into any of this? And we see that all the time. I mean, you know, certainly there's a lot of bad storytelling that goes on out there, right? Oh, a lot yeah. Of, a lot of terrible um, 
disconnects. I, I don't know. It, I think it's getting worse. Oh, um, it's it, definitely it got better and then it got worse. Yeah, yeah. it's, um, I mean, everything is so polarized. It's mm -hmm. not, um, there's no nice middle gray. Nobody can, I'm, because of the climate that we're in, it's almost like we used to be able to agree to disagree. And now mm -hmm. it's just a lot of disagreeable <laughs> yeah. people. It, it's really become an interesting landscape, which says to me that perhaps um, we're not really understanding how people are mm -hmm. feeling and we're not taking the time to ask questions and to probe a little bit more and to at least recognize that, you know, if it, it might be a different story. It might not be a story that you like, it could be a different story, but at least giving somebody the opportunity to share something, to question, well, where did you learn that from? Or maybe they have something that you need to know. And at the end of the day, if you can at least not shut down and perhaps have somebody feel heard, you won't get this anger and polarization and we lose the healthy discourse that we used to have. Well, I mean, anybody that turns on the, any news source these days, of course, that's you can't help but feel that way. Um, right. And and I, you know, I used to hope that, and st I still do hope sometimes that social media and that the networks that we cultivate ourselves are mm -hmm. refuges from that um, in some ways. But obviously when you are a communicator, a professional communicator, you know, you don't get to pick and choose who your audiences are. Right. You have, you have to do it on behalf of somebody. So how would you advise a communicator, um, working for a brand and does, you know, it doesn't matter what you can choose, but working for a brand, like what are the pitfalls in the kind of minds that they landmines they should be looking out for right now? So there are probably a lot of landmines and that's where I go right to the ethics <laughs> part of my work. Um, I'm actually coming out with a book called answers for ethical marketers. I just saw the cover. <laughs> I'm so Ooh. excited. Yeah. It's actually, um, I haven't announced it yet, but it's on Amazon. <laughs> it's there. Um, so I'll be rolling out with that, but I really think that a lot of, uh, what you're sharing, who you're sharing it with, where you're sharing it, the way that you respond and react, if we could all step back and remember our ethics, our values to take the do no harm approach. I mean, that's really, really important in our communication, uh, I'm sure I, I do a lot of media training and I know that executives feel like if they go on this show and they have to share, it's a landmine. You offer what you can. You're never going to mislead. You don't share anything that you're not supposed to share. I mean, we, we follow those guidelines, of course, but at the same time, if you can keep with the ethics and with your values and not, um, I think there's a lot of hubris and ego going into conversations. I think we also have to just know when to listen, when to take it all in. Like I said, ask a question, recognize a different perspective, not get angry mm -hmm. over it. That doesn't help. And then always, always, if it's an opportunity to get back to somebody later with information, that's fine. So there's lots of ways. There's always going to be landmines. We're going to have to start um, realizing that we can't just show up with our own talking points. Now, it doesn't work that way anymore. Yep. What is it? What's going on in the world? You know, you're going to be asked questions. Be prepared. Answer what you can. Move to what that audience needs to know and deliver something that helps people. And yeah. I think if you stick with that, you can't go wrong. Yeah. And I completely agree about the talking points situation. Yeah. You know, full disclosure, I'm also a communications professional, right? And I write my share of talking points or I've, mm -hmm. I've had to vet my share of talking points. But the longer I'm in this business, the longer I see this happening. And, you know, I'm, I'm very fortunate to be working with organizations right now that, you know, are not really controversial in any way necessarily, or that don't really hit on some of those kind of really sensitive pressure points in our civilization at this moment. So, I mean, count, I count myself fortunate that I haven't right. had to deal with that stuff. But I get this feeling that some of the trouble that we see and some of the, you know, general angst and disconnect and confusion is due to 
the preponderance of talking points. So you have your brand or your famous person or your politician or whoever the speaker, the person with the message is. Right. But behind them or next to them, you've got your flack, right? You've got your (laughs) spokesperson who's supposed to be telling them exactly how to communicate. And these people, all of us, have come through a profession now for decades. And this profession has told us and has really solidified around the fact that, no, no, you don't have to say anything you don't want to say. And you don't have to share what you don't want to share, which should be true. Right. Right. And you don't have to answer any questions if you don't want to answer any questions. And I don't know where I feel about that. Like, I don't know exactly how I feel about that. Ultimately, it's up to, I guess, the journalist or the questioner to keep pushing or not. Right. But that's on the one hand, you have that. On the other hand, you have the journalists or the, you know, whoever's asking the questions who decided the moment, whatever moment in time to accept the talking point and to accept the the fact that they're not going to answer the question. Right. So we have a problem coming from both ends where the facts or the truth or whatever it is, the message is manufactured and the quest to gain the actual truth behind that message is truncated or, you know, kind of halted or mellowed or I don't know, like dulled, right? How is this going to get resolved? (laughs) You know, I would (laughs) see we might see more of the same. I I want to add one more in though. Yeah. I see that the executives who show up and who actually say things because they either get flustered or their mind isn't clear or they're caught on the spot, they feel pressured that they go down a rabbit hole that they didn't even have to go down. Mm-hmm. So that that's another part of what's going on because there are these conversations. And I'll also share that even some of the companies that you probably feel like, oh no, you don't have to worry about them. Mm, mm-hmm. I, I don't know, because you can be anybody and still be asked a question. What's your stance on oh, yeah. <laughs> something exactly. that happened in the news? And that's tough because, oh, those talking points weren't necessarily prepared. I feel like if you're going to be on, you know, make an appearance, TV, mm-hmm. radio, podcast, live streaming, you just need to be up on what's going on and ready to yeah. share your thoughts. And, and that is especially tough because organizations, your culture, your people, right? You, mm-hmm. you serve your people, you serve your customers. Who are you going to stand up and take a stance for? So that's uh, all these tricky issues. Yeah. You know, so the conflict's not going to be resolved anytime soon, right? But No. Um, I think it has to be managed. Mm-hmm. I think it has to, um, I mean, let's face it, eventually a journalist, if you watch cable, eventually they will move on. They'll even say, you're not going to yeah. answer that question. And pretty mm-hmm. much the person's like, no, I can't answer that question right now. I'd mm-hmm. like to, but I don't, I don't have that information or, right? They're yeah. not, yeah. You're, you're at an impasse. And, and both sides have been trained mm-hmm. to, to be that way. Right? Exactly. And, and, and there's and reasons. There I is mean, reasons. Clearly. So journalists or, or hosts, it's about ratings, right? Mm-hmm. You want to get the information, right? You, you want to get it out to your audience. And at the same time, companies, there's things that you're not going to share publicly because maybe the timing is wrong and it's going to create a lot of, you're going to hurt a lot of people. And what's the do no harm rule, right? In in Mm -hmm. ethics, is is your communication fair to everybody? Well, look out there today. I don't know how much of it is (laughs) is the fair do no harm. I think also there's an unreasonable expectation on behalf of a lot of brands for sure, but certainly maybe even some agencies and, you know, well-intended consultants to um, get their person, get their brand, get their message out there no matter what, you know, get it to all the people that need to hear it, but they don't have a, maybe they don't have their best idea of who those people are necessarily, or maybe they have some delusions of grandeur and think that their message is so important to the public at large. You know, it it comes down to really understanding the audience's need, understanding who the audience is, the real audience is, and then being able to communicate properly with that audience. And there's so many layers of complexity that, that have entered the profession over the last 20 20 years plus, not the least of which is social media. And there are are ways to kind of discern what those audiences are. But something you said earlier, I think, was so 
it's such a small word, but it's really important. It keeps coming up again and again is this whole concept of values, of what are the values that you're working with as a communicator, who you're representing, mm-hmm. or as an executive, what your values are for what the company's values are. Because frankly, if those are, are in conflict oh. with, with what is happening, then you don't have too many choices except to either change your values, <laughs> you know, have a serious culture change moment top to bottom in your company, or figure out a way that you can make your values understood you know, assuming we're not talking about evil values, you know. <laughs> yeah, I mean, but just values in in general within. So we all have our own set of values. And I like to tell younger professionals, you don't go into the office, forget about your own personal values and then adopt those of your companies. First of all, I always say it, it's a little test, but I like to ask professionals in 30 seconds or less, can you define your values? And they're usually like, uh, <laughs> you know, I got to think about it. Let me, <laughs> let me come back to you. So everybody should know their own set of values. Then you go into your company and hopefully there is a really strong alignment because if your personal values don't align with your company, that's an issue right yeah. there. If there is alignment and that's all well and good, the whole put the values on a plaque, <laughs> mm-hmm. put it in the handbook, put it on the walls. That doesn't matter because actually when people read those values, depending on your culture, depending on how you were raised, depending on who you are and everything about you, you might actually perceive the value differently. So you have to teach people what the behavior is. That's the most important part. That's why it's Mm -hmm. so important for leaders to be role models Because then people can see the behaviors acting out from those beliefs. And that's where you get less communications issues and challenges because you actually see the behavior and you say, okay, I know what to do and what not to do. And I'm going to adopt this for my firm. And it's a part of my own belief system as well. Absolutely. I mean, I've seen it go the way where, you know, where the values are well accepted and understood and they're communicated well. And certainly when I was, you know, in my agency days, we worked on some really great campaigns that were extremely values driven and purpose driven. And now, of course, um, being purpose driven is just part of, it's part and parcel of everything that we do at every level. It's expected. Yeah. Millennials expect companies that they work for to be purpose driven. I did a, a year plus study on millennials. And it was all about um, what kind of communication they needed, what types of interactions. And after over a hundred, it was very, very clear that they want you to be purpose-driven, to really feel for the cause, to stand up for the cause, right? They want that shared energy and passion. Yeah. And and this year has been a crucible of sorts in, in, right. in many ways for, for that. Mm-hmm. In some ways, I'm, maybe some companies are, are actually going into a reaction or a rebound against, against this, um, where they're just like, no, I'm not talking about uh, any purpose or, or any, you know, I'm not making a stand about anything. I'm just doing my product and this thing is all going to pass us by. And they're very likely wrong about that. Yeah, I think they're very <laughs> likely very, wrong because Gen Z wrong. on the heels of millennials are just as purpose-driven. <laughs> what do you think about that? I mean, I, you know, I I have, you know, I guess my daughters are sort of at the edge of Gen Z, right? They're, mm-hmm. you know, they're teenagers. And I know I've, and I'm, I'm an Xer. Yeah, I'm, I'm an Xer cusp of boomer. <laughs> oh. Well, you're, you're more of an, you're, you know, you're certainly an Xer though. I mean, you know, <laughs> Thank you, you. You, you get that, you know, there's th- this whole kind of, we founded the internet. So, <laughs> you know, us Xers are sort of ironic. You know, we, we look at everything with a, with a heavy dash of irony. Um, But looking at the millennials, and I don't like to paint any group with a broad brush because, you know, everybody knows I've got tons of friends and connections and people who have been on this show who are millennials and they will be, and I love you all. However, them being purpose-driven is a real thing, mm-hmm. you know? The Gen Zers, I'm getting this feeling that they're a little bit, they're certainly purpose-driven, don't get me wrong, but they have some of that kind of Gen X bite to them. Mm. Um, they're, they're interesting. Yeah. They're, they're like they're purpose-driven different. and very heavy, heavily 
cash driven at the same time in some ways. Yeah. So for me with Gen Z, I noticed that they are purpose driven. However, they're a different breed than Gen Z in the sense that they will raise their hand and say, um, I need help. <laughs> I, uh -huh. I want to understand this. And I find that millennials are very much, yes, they are truly the purpose driven. I'm going to do, do for the cause, uh, very passionate, but they won't let you know that it's not okay. Like I'm not fine. Um, I need help. And that's an interesting difference when you have, um, when you have millennials on the team and you have a Gen Zer on the team, which is an intern. So now mm -hmm. I'm talking a personal story. I noticed that the, the intern in college will say, whoa, hey, I need help here. And why are we doing this? Why would we do that before we do this? Mm -hmm. Which is really interesting. Yeah. So they are different. Yeah, I, I, I do have, I have high hopes. Um, because <laughs> because they are my daughters, you know, I have to, I have to say that. Uh, oh, I think they're gonna be a great generation. And you know what, millennials, I love millennials. And a lot of people will say, oh, they're lazy. I'm like, no, no, no mm -hmm. they just, want you to meet their passion. <laughs> yeah. And if you can do that, they'll go the distance. Yeah. I can't speak about any other industry from like, I mean, I work with millennials in my current role and certainly, you know, across whatever companies I've been with, but particularly in PR and in marketing, the, the, the people who are of that age group, you know, have been the hardest driving people that I've ever dealt with. I yeah. mean, just, dedicated because once they're on uh, in agreement with the purpose, it's like no holds barred. Right. You know, in my agency time, and I'm not going to, of course, name any clients or anything, but I, I worked on a cause and I was what, 10, 15 years older, 10 years older, probably than the nearest person on my team. And, you know, but I, I always felt like I'm a, I'm a, at that time I was a young early forties person, you know, <laughs> uh, but I was definitely, I definitely felt the, the difference. And the next person on the team was my boss, right? So my boss is old, was younger, a lot younger than me. And I never mind that, by the way. But um, in this case, we had this, this cause to work on. And I have no feelings about this cause at all. Like I will tell you, <laughs> right, I support it. I'm fine with it. But personally, Just didn't my life me. could go on, uh, you know, not my thing. Right. But when I would try to say that to my boss. It was like I was speaking Martian, <laughs> right? There's a definite cognitive dissonance and I yeah. didn't understand the idea of cognitive dissonance yet <laughs> at that time, but this taught me about it, you know? So, whereas I just couldn't, I couldn't drum up all the energy and excitement about it. I mean, I would do the work, be like, yeah, sure, I'll sure. do this. But like, okay, you can be excited about it. I'm, I'm not against it. I'm not for it. I'm, I'm just fine. But like, that's a Gen X thing. Yeah. Right? Like, <laughs> fine, I'll just do it. I don't, I don't mind. Yeah. And when I say I don't I'm care. I'm up to the task. I'm up to the task, you know? <laughs> not how. I'm not a slacker. Um, <laughs> oh, no. Gen, Gen X, we are not slackers. <laughs> that's, that's, by the way, that's a Bill Murray uh, channeling of mine. I, I'm terrible with quotes. I'm terrible with <laughs> like remembering, like memorizing things. But I have a couple of Bill Murrayisms that just every once in a while pop out. And, they pop out. And I'm not a slacker from, from I believe it was from Stripes. It's one of my oh, favorite yeah. things. But anyway, um, I got into a little bit of trouble there, you know, like <laughs> relationship wise. You know, the work was fine, but relationship wise, I don't know if like if my colleagues were really like, like they were like side eyeing me for a little while. Like, <laughs> mm, you know, as he we see with the program and I don't know, it's OK. Now. I'm fine with it now. And I can joke around with those guys and girls about it now, now that I'm not there anymore. But it was hard um, then, probably. It was hard then. It's <laughs> also because. I felt this, this is something that came with me from my Japan days. You know, as you know, I've, I've lived in Japan for 15 or 16 years. And one of the values of the culture and one of the, uh, I guess, the behaviors that's inculcated from, you know, the moment you enter professional society is hierarchy mm -hmm. and deference. And deference is one of those things that really stuck with me. So when I came back to the States after having lived in Japan for so long, I got into a little bit of trouble because, you know, I wouldn't question my bosses, you know, yeah. I wouldn't question them. Different and that even, and mm -hmm. that even happened, at, you know, in the agency, like I just, I would hear what my bosses have said and they're like, well, okay, you're my boss. Right. Whereas I was expected to challenge them. And 
that was extremely hard for me, if not impossible at times. And it ended up causing trust issues. Oh, that's interesting. And I, and I fully am aware of this now. And, you know, going back to EQ, it's all mm-hmm. part of being self-aware. But when I'm in with the boss or with the senior person, I tend to defer. And it's not because I don't want to challenge a question. It's not because I have, I have a doubt. But if I have a doubt or, or if, I'm, if I have an issue, I will do it separately, quietly, in a different way. Right. Right. Um, but they want you to do it as right it's there. happening. Mm-hmm. And, and they do it as sign it's of a real. I mean, that's a good leader. Seriously, somebody uh, who does not want a bunch of yes people mm-hmm. around them, yeah. right? Who wants to hear all different perspectives, um, but at the same time, on your end, you are programmed, right? If you're operating in such a fashion mm-hmm. as a part of a culture, it's you know it's ingrained. Mm-hmm. It becomes ingrained in you. It's it's part of your. You called it the default, right? Um, but the um, your default network or your operating system. It's almost you've... like a habit. The yeah. Charles Duhigg wrote a book, The Power of Habit, mm-hmm. on how to break your habits because you literally have to carve a new path in your brain <laughs> to make yeah. it happen, you know, for again, the boss who wants you on the spot to do something. Again and again and again, you have to fix you have to play with your networks and to, mm-hmm. because they're malleable. Right. right? Um in fact, the fact that I'm here talking to you is a sign <laughs> that I'm over that because I, yes. although I am absolutely have serious, deep respect for you, Deirdre, I'm here. I Thank feel like you. we're here as uh, equals Total and as equals. people who are just like having a great conversation. Whereas the old me would have been like very obsequious probably and just thinking about, oh, you know, not willing to challenge anything. Although you're not saying anything that I would challenge anyhow. I'm just saying, <laughs> you know. Um, but if you did, it, it would be great because it oh, makes for a better conversation. There's well, no I doubt about it. I have, I a hundred percent agree with that. I think we're having a fantastic conversation, Me which too. is why it's, you know, I realized that we're, we're starting to come to the end of our time. And oh I wanted gosh. to just make sure before we do that, that, um, we cover off on, uh, like some very important points here, which is that you are a, a leader in the field. I mean, you've been a, a professor and an instructor in communications. You, help executives and important people and companies to be better communicators. You are a strategic communicator and, you know, an author of several books. PR 2.0 is one of them. And mm-hmm. I happen to have put in the public back in public relations on my desk right now because I was thinking of pulling out something from here and saying, Deirdre, what do you think about this now? But, um, <laughs> so much has changed. I mean, there's, there's a lot of concepts that stay the same, but so yeah. much has changed. Well, I was looking at it and it's like, there's this whole section about you are the customer and you know, feel the pain and deliver the pain killer was one of the things that you and Brian, it's co-written by, uh, with uh, Brian Solis and, or is it Solis? Brian Solis? Solis. I don't know. Yeah, I don't um, know. I think I always said Solis, but. It I always said Solis, Solis too. Um, <laughs> but uh, Brian, if you're listening, I'm, I do apologize if I put you. Yes, me too, last Brian. Time. I should know this. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, but the thing is, like, I was looking at that. I'm going, well, that's still true. It's like, still true. It's still it, 100% true. Yeah. Which, by the way, is a ringing endorsement for putting the public back in public relations. <laughs> People should read it. Um, Thank you. Yeah, but I was, I was trying to get in mind of how have things changed really, and what's coming next. Like, what do you see as happening in the field, uh, whether it's in PR or in, in PR and marketing and communications? You know that we should all be aware of, and um, you know what do you think we should be doing to prepare and be ready for it. Well, I think it's playing out now and we're going to see more of it. The artificial intelligence, Mm -hmm. the marketing automation, that is something that public relations, we need to be educating on. We need to make sure that we understand how our brands are communicating because our customers, I mean, after all, I, I think, I don't remember what book I wrote it in, or maybe it was a course for LinkedIn Learning, but... I gave a little case study on how there was um, a health app. And when seniors were using this app, they actually thought that they were communicating with a real person. Hmm. And, you know, whether it was a health professional, it wasn't. It was a chat bot. So we're, we're going to have, with all the automation, with all the, the ways that artificial intelligence knows us and the information that we're sharing... We just have to make sure our customers understand what they're giving away, 
who they're talking to, how we're securing their private information. So data privacy, security, that is absolutely in our realm. Yeah. Um, I think we're going to see a lot of the live streaming, anybody who is not comfortable with video as a communicator and doing it through multiple streams has to learn to get a lot more comfortable. I think we see it. Many people, many communicators who are interested in podcasting, some are doing live streaming, but more and more and more and more uh, mm -hmm. because it's not really about us. It's what people like. And I think these live stream shows are capturing attention. That's, that's the painkiller. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So um, we always need to be up with what people prefer. And this, this hasn't changed. I think I said this in PR 2.0 and putting the public back in public relations and social media in public relations. So that has not changed. And I also think that, you know, because of the women worldwide, the network and the emotional intelligence, you know, for 30 years, I have always focused, Dan, on strategic communications, right? Mm -hmm. You always are looking at your goals and objectives and your messaging and you know the channels and the formats and you're making sure that you're always compliant to get to this point of engagement. And what I find is most important today, that when you get to the engagement, if you don't have what I call this feel lens, and feel is a communications model. It stands for face your fears, engage with empathy, live with ethics and good judgment, and unleash the love. If you don't apply that at that point of engagement, you're never going to get to the real relationship, the advocacy, the loyalty, and the impact that we really, really want. It's the difference between have an engagement and it's a one-off, maybe it's a one transaction and that's it. If you want a real relationship, that acronym FEEL, mm -hmm. that has to happen. You need a FEEL lens in your communications. It's all about that relationship, isn't it? Mm -hmm. you know, that is so critical. Deirdre, this has been, I mean, this has been an amazing conversation. I'm glad that you're right. Another book is coming out because, because I was just thinking to myself, I need another book. <laughs> Thank I, you. I'm, I'm being a little facetious about that. I, I, was, I was joking around about this recently that every single time I have a podcast guest and a lot of times that I'm speaking with, uh, with the people that I'm meeting these days, I come out with a book recommendation almost from every single conversation. So I have stacks and stacks, but I'm so glad that you are that you are doing a, a, a new one. I really mean that because I do want to uh, stay on top of, of what you're doing and you know, bring I it back on to talk that. about that when you're ready to do that. But in the meantime, all the great work that you're doing, as I mentioned earlier on, um, especially with regard to diversity and inclusion and re with regard to certainly with women, as an advocate for women, I think I would recommend any of our listeners to go to womenworldwideshow.com. I got that right. It's .com, correct? Yes, womenworldwideshow.com. Right. Yeah. Yep. So womenworldwideshow.com and check out all of Deirdre's interviews. There's a great blog there. Um, there's all kinds of information um, about Deirdre, about her guests, uh, and certainly all the work that's going on for women. Also check out Deirdre at her LinkedIn profile. And if you're wondering how to spell her name, it will be spelled properly in the title of this episode, I promise, because I have misspelled it before and I'm very sorry about that. <laughs> and they can also but, go to DeirdreBreckenridge.com. You'll find and, all things me there. <laughs> DeirdreBreckenridge.com. Again, yeah. the, the spelling will be in the title of this episode. So, um, so please go there and you want to get to know Deirdre, trust me, um, as a communicator, as a marketer, as a PR professional, it can only do you good. So thank you so much for being here, Deidre. And thank so good you. to know you. Oh, it's, it's so great to know you. I'm glad we're Thanks connected. So If you enjoyed this episode of The Dan Nessel Show, please head on over to iTunes, Spotify, Google Podcasts, or the podcast player of your choice to subscribe, rate, and leave a review. And please don't forget to spread the word. Thanks for listening.